Hello everybody, I'm Benjamin Magnus. Welcome to our first post-release dev diary. Well, first major dev diary post-release for Imperator Rome. Uh, so there was the... Uh, everyone knows that there was the release kerfuffle. The game is not getting rave reviews. We are currently sitting on a whopping 39% approval rating on Steam, which I believe is the worst for the actual base game. On Steam reviews. Well, it's not a uh, totally accurate... Steam reviews, you know, they're not totally accurate. There's review bombs and there's some irrational things on there, but it is still a decent barometer for the state of a game, and sitting on mostly negative for a uh, for a major release like this is not a good thing for Paradox. But, anywho, let's get back into the dev diary. It is lengthy, so we're going to dive into it, and hopefully the things we read will put a little... Uh, Breathe a little life into this. So unlike land combat, naval combat in Imperator Rome at release was in many ways inherited from its predecessors, EU Rome, which I kind of call bullshit on there. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is, yes, it is basically the same thing, but they also said they, they couldn't bring in major things from other games because this game has a different framework, so it's not as simple as just bringing, you, you know, importing stuff over so if you can't import the good stuff over why are we importing the bad stuff but anywho i digress well one sentence in and we're already like hey oh, hey, oh there paradox that system builds on ships having a chance of ships uh, targeting other ships and dealing damage to them that was a lot of ships sometimes even being able to damage uh, to their friends the EU Rome system also has only one type of ship with modifiers representing the differences in naval designs as well as tactics between the different parts of the map, most notably the discrepancy between naval philosophy between the Eastern and Western Mediterranean. While function functional, well, I'll go give them that, it is functional, especially for small engagements, we felt the system did not adequately reflect the realities of Hellenic and Roman naval combat. What were these realities then? Well, yeah, they got that right. It's I guess it's fine for tiny little naval things, but... With no naval cap and uh, it being super, super, super easy to make tons of money, all you do is spam ships to see who's got more. Detailed accounts of naval battles from the era are actually somewhat sparse. Historically, navies were made up uh, by a great variety of different types of ships, damn straight, with different roles. Normally, ships from this area are classified by the number of rowers in one section used to propel them. Correct. Three is bigger than two, but smaller than six and would be used for different purposes. Uh, so I do not know correct, correct pronunciations there, and I know if I say it with an, uh, with an English inflection, people will get upset. If I do it with a Latin inflection, people will get upset as well. So I'm just going to go with what I just said. Uh, a directed naval battle would also involve galleys forming a line of battle with the goal of uh, preventing the opposing side from forcing through it. The primary ways for ships to engage were bombardment using arrows and artillery, boarding, and ramming. Heavier ships would generally be taller and harder to board. Ships heavier than twos and threes would also generally be a cataphract covered to protect from arrows. Over time, ships would grow bigger and bigger, especially in the confrontations between the big and very rich successor kingdoms in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the Western Mediterranean, ships would never be as big with the ascendant of the Roman Empire, and the custom to build the bigger ships would be forgotten, with the Battle of Actium generally being regarded as the end of the big ship era. At the start of the game, however, and for most of the timeline, the trend in the east was to big, greater, build greater and greater ships, with some truly huge galleys seeing the light of day. The use of these enormous ships with 10 sections of rowers or more remain a point of discussion to this day. William M. Murray argues that these behemoths of the sea were more useful for siegecraft, used for naval assaults on the many ports of the Aegean, the Levant, and Asia Minor. Their big maritime Attachments, huge and very heavy, high-quality rams, a modern laboratory test concluded that heavier rams in use in this area are impressive even uh, in the light of modern engineering, used to capture ports by forcing through floating barriers as well as carrying full siege engines and catapults on board. The various ways to do the latter was something Greek Navy specialized in general in, with manuals written at the time for how to use, uh, how to best conquer or defend a port by sea. The super heavy ships, which in Imperator is considered to be anything above eight sections of rowers, were never extremely common, but they did have a given place in navies of the East, and we wanted to include them and their role, so our rework is inspired by Murray's work. To better cover the variety and uses of navies, will be forming a line of battle. I think that I think we're missing some punctuation there, but I think it's it's, it's saying that navies actually form a line of battle now. <laughs> 
As on land, there will be a first row, a second row, and a flank. Ship types will be broken into three categories, and individual ship types will have strengths and weaknesses. Mainly, the goal is to allow different roles for light and medium ships based on their usage in the era. Good. Light ships have a high maneuver. Oh, I really wish there were transport twos, because that actually was, was an important thing. The fact that the, the warships generally were not actually transporting all of the giant, you know, naval invasions uh never mind I'm, I'm i'm digressing here light ships will have high maneuver allowing them to target opposing ships much further from their position in the line of battle and can deal more morale damage medium ships have less maneuver range but are instead more resistant to damage the wood trade will now be cons uh, considered to represent access to great amounts of high quality shipbuilding wood and will no longer be necessary for the lighter ships, since these should generally be buildable by the wood that would be available in most cities, even if it was not their primary export. The medium ships, however, still require access to wood, and importing wood helps the quantity of all ships produced. So that means everybody can build ships at any point now, but you're limited to light ships, and the wood will allow you to build the heavier ships. Heavy ships 8s and 10s will ha have a very limited maneuver with the 10s just able to target the ship directly in front of them. While they can deal a great deal of uh, strength damage and probably easily sink any given ship in front of them, they are likely to be swarmed and sunk or even captured in fighting without support against a great number of light ships. Heavy ships will, however, have access to three unit abilities, more on that below, and since their niche use was more common in the Eastern Mediterranean, they will require unlocking via military traditions. Traditions that do not unlock heavy ships will instead strengthen the use of lighter and medium ships. Lastly, when possible, ships will make use of the cultural names. A Greek Byrim will, uh, for instance, go by the name of Lembos, while an Illyrian or even Roman uh, will be called a Liburnian. Interesting. And now we get to the meat of this, the actual different ship types, and you can see their little pictures up in here still, too. Light ships, high maneuver and extra morale damage dealt useful on flanks and possibly in the first row. Probably because in the first row they'd be able to swarm heavier ships in the first row a little bit easier, but they do not require the use of wood. The Liburnian, uncovered by Reem, cheap, very light ship, very quick, used by pirates near our start, but is later one of the main Roman war vessels. It deals low damage against everyone, but has extra morale damage, morale damage dealt to it. Six Maneuver allows targeting ships very far away in battle. So I think that's probably going to mean it can target ships up to six, uh, six, six blips away on the front line, or maybe possibly three in either direction. And then we got the, uh, the, I think this would be the traditional one we would have been working with. Uh, I'm just going to call it a trireme because that's what I'm used to. Could historically be covered or uncovered. Light ship, but heavier than the La Liburnian Byremes. Also very quick. A bit more expensive. Takes more damage uh, than the Liburnians. Has four maneuvers. Now we move into the medium ship. So that light ship thing was basically everything we had. was just those triremes there. Fours, fives, sixes, and sevens. Wow. Are those each a something we can build? Wow, that's interesting. That is interesting. It's not just like, no, like medium one, medium two, medium three. We actually there's there's a bunch in there. Okay, anyway, uh, better staying power, but are much slower. Historically, these are ships that would go prow to prow, much more efficient at both ramming, which is strength damage, and boarding for capturing. Vulnerable uh, to the sides against lighter ships requires the use of wood. So these are the ones that actually require the wood resource to use. Oh, you know what I just noticed? I thought fours, fives, sixes, and sevens was four different categories. I think fours and fives is one category. Sixes and sevens is one category. So we've got twos, threes, fours, and fives, sixes, and sevens for a total of four different categories there. So cataphracts with four rows. We're looking right over here. More costly for uh, and for a long time, the standard ship in any Navy does not excel at anything, but is also not bad at anything. So that's just your middle of the road three maneuver right there then we've got our giant our cataphract six rows much slower but still in widespread use for much of the era extra strength damage uh dealt and only one maneuver so that's really slow so now we move on to our heavy ships eights nines tens up to 16s and 40s extremely expensive i hope so because right now they're 
navies are super freaking cheap to just make massive, like, hundreds of ships without any issue. Huge rams fitted with catapults and siege weapons, vulnerable to being isolated and attacked from many sides, stopped being used entirely around the end of the game, but during the Greek era would make up up to 30% of a fleet, requires a military tradition to unlock, which we saw above. War Elephants of the Seas. Oh, I love that. No, it would be great if we if we loaded some War Elephants of the Land onto the War Elephants of the Seas for transport. Take less damage, deal more damage against everyone, has zero maneuver, so can only engage directly in front of them. And then we have the Mega Polyreme. Extremely expensive, represents a ship of size 10 and up, withstands more strength damage, can create a breach on a seaside fort. So the only way to, to breach the, the walls of a seaside um, fort is with one of those. So you need you need at least one of those in your... I would probably say one per fort level to make that work. That sounds nice. And here we can actually see a, a line of battle forming. Now, I can I can see the difference in the icons. But like a quick a quick glance at this, they all look... If you just quickly look at this, they all kind of look the same. I think you might we might want to change these icons so they look a little bit different. And I think it's funny that we're still going with... Uh, with various types of animals. Now we have sea critters uh, for the for the tactics, which I like. I mean, sometimes it doesn't make a whole sense to me, like shock being a moose, but we're not going to get into that. When a ship reaches zero morale while not yet being at zero strength, there's a chance it will be captured. Capturing chance will be based on the type of ship that was targeting the removed ship and the removed ship itself. So we have basically a rock, paper, scissors kind of situation going there. Medium, mediums and heavies have slightly higher chance to capture light ships, but since lighter ships deal more morale damage, they will get more chances to capture ships overall. A fleet of only light ships is far more likely to take uh, a higher number of prize, prizes in any given battle. So light ships have a higher chance of getting of getting that roll, basically, but a he but one on one, a heavy ch ship has a higher chance to capture a light ship, which makes sense to me because it'll have a larger crew. A captured ship is still removed from battle, but will be added to the opposing navy that the battle that the capturing ship belongs to. Makes perfect sense. Oh, and here we go. What do we got? Uh, I'll zoom in on this while I'm editing. So we got frontal assault, naval envelopment that looks like some sort of octopi, uh, close ranks. I can't tell. Uh, honestly, I can't tell what that is without zooming in. Um, I'm going to go with crab. And we got harassment. So we've got like a porpoise and probing attack, a seal. All right. I mean, you know, when I think of dolphins, I definitely think of them harassing people. Definitely. Anywho, uh, that's adorable, though. I love it. With more ship types available, the tactic system is going to be used at sea as well. Depending on our composition, different tactics will have varying efficiencies. Choice of tactics can also affect how likely the battle is to result in the capture of enemy ships. Good. Makes sense. Okay, so here are our clickable mana buttons. Um, now, I'm not super happy that we're just adding on more buttons to use mana on, uh, but uh, right, right now, adding complexity to the game regardless, not regardless, but, you know, and then worrying about balance maybe later is, is a good thing to, to me because right now there's just not enough to do in the game. So anyway, capture port. Unit ability that can be used by a navy that has five heavy ships in it takes direct control over an unfortified port, useful for establishing a beachhead before a full-on naval invasion. That is pretty cool. That means if a port does not, that gives you more incentives to, to fort up your ports, because that means if there's not a fort there, somebody can just go in and take it, and then without having to do a naval landing, they can land troops, be they just move the ships into the port, bam, they're there. Port rate. Unit ability that can be used on a fortified port with an ongoing siege by a navy that has at least one heavy ship above 95% strength. So if it's heavily damaged, or lightly damaged even, you can't use it. Immediately creates a breach and reduces the heavy ship's strength by 30%, so it takes some damage but breaches the enemy's wall. You got a port assault. Heavy, uh, heavy unit ability, no, just unit ability. Unit ability that can be used on a fortified port with one fort level by a navy that has at least one mega polyreme at full strength. Reduces the fort by one level and reduces strength of the hyper galley. Is that for, is that, is that phrase been used in this dev diary yet? Hyper galley? Is it a me mega polyreme or a hyper galley? <laughs> this sounds like, st like Stellaris stuff we're getting into now. Let me read this over again. Used on a fortified port with one fort level 
with one fort level. So does that mean only one or or two ships for two level, three ships for three level? I feel like that's a little ambiguous there. Reduces that fort by one level. Reduces the strength of the hyper galley by 20%. So it damages it. Does that mean that you could just click a button and like demolish the fort? Not demolish it, but no, it says reduces the fort level. So if it's at one, does that mean, does that just eliminate the, okay, that one I'm curious about because that one seems a little strange to me. Reduces the fort level. So, you know, that that part's obvious. Two to one, leaving one layer. But if you're at one, does it reduce it to zero and then allow you to just move in there? That, I guess we'll have to wait and see. This is something that is interesting for me because naval attrition is technically a thing in the game. Not, but I've never once worried about it because it's never been a problem. So, I think this might be useful. Naval range. All countries will now have a naval range calculated from their closest owned port. Thank freaking God. Closest owned port, because a lot of the things are from your, like, capital to capital, things like that, and capital to capital stuff is fucking stupid. Anyway, moving on. Naval range will be somewhat forgiving. Um, the ships and navies that go outside of their naval range will take heavy attrition. That makes sense. Because as it st stands right now, like, I, I played in the Bosporus before and sailed my navy, like, up to Scandinavia to go slave raiding with no issues. That makes sense. And it's from the nearest port. Love it. Okay, good. Navigatable rivers. Work in progress screenshot from navigatable rivers. These rivers will have a different look to more clearly show them as navigatable, though uh, they do not show that right now. So they're going to visually change the look of large rivers so you can navigate them. While most rivers will not have been fit for galleys in this area uh, to make much use of them, some rivers will now be navigatable. For land units, such uh, a river will have to be uh, crossable at fording points similar to straits. Interesting. Land provinces adjacent to great rivers will also have an increased population capacity. More on that in a later date. Okay, so major rivers are going to actually be more useful because they will, they will have a higher population limit, which I'm assuming translates as higher pop growth. That's the only thing I can think of right now. But also, you cannot just walk across a great river at any point. You have to find a ford. Good! Choke points on major rivers. Makes sense. And we have a naval terrain now. Makes sense as well. Not all sea areas are created equal. In the Pompeii patch, there will be three different terrain types, which will have an effect on which ships are more efficient there, and in some cases may confer a defender advantage. Open seas have no combat modifiers. Coastal seas, used in archipelagos and in areas adjacent to land, do we have a defender advantage? Okay, like it, makes sense. River terrain, navigable rivers will favor the defender and greatly favor lighter ships. Can you imagine trying to have a major naval engagement on a navigable river? That, okay, uh, oh, here we go. I was about to say, where is this other one? I'm thi no, that's not it, is it? No, maybe. Maybe? Maybe this light blue. I can't really see the, the denial is where I would want to see, but you can kind of see it over here by where, like, Venice is. Although that, that could just be, like, marshland or something, and I'm not... Uh, and I Because I don't have this map memorized in terms of terrain. Anywho, moving on. To summarize these changes to naval battles, the goal we aim for is for naval combat to be more dynamic for what type of navy you want to build and to be more of a choice and dependent on your circumstances. Excellent. We also wanted to have a strong relation to how naval battles were fought and theorized in the era and make it possible for navies to play a role in projecting their military abilities overseas uh, as was done by the successor commanders such as Demetrius. If you want to spend the resources on it, you should be able to build a naval force adept at capturing islands and ports, which should be especially useful in the Aegean, damn straight, ma uh, making maintaining a navy more meaningful both offensively and defensively. Exactly. And now we move on to religion, an area of the game which was also completely ignored, it seems, because no reli all religions are basically the same as, as in the game right now. As long as your people are your religion, everything is fine, and no religions have, a, you know, basically a difference, which seems silly. But anywho, let's, let, let's read on what they're going to give us on omens and religions. 
as was mentioned in Johan's design corner post yesterday, uh, another thing we want to achieve in the Pompeii patch is give more variety in how different countries play. Thank freaking God, because right now they all feel exactly the same. One of the things we will be doing to achieve this is the addition of base country modifier bonuses for religions, such as Tuistic State will, uh, for instance, have an easier time migrating their pops, while Canaanite countries may have an easier time setting up new trade routes. Good. A difference in religion is welcome. Let's try to suss out this next sentence. We will also be omens depending on your religion and culture, meaning that depending on which religion your country is, you will be able to leverage different advantages from your religious establishment. Okay, so I think that's saying that different religions will have different mechanics. That means that Buddhist and uh, Kemetics uh, have completely different omens to pick from. Oh, they're saying there are different omens for different religions. There you go, but it does not extend to different weight. Buddhist intimates will have completely different omens to pick from, but it does not only extend to different religions. Romans and Greeks also no longer share their omens, and should Egypt adopt the Serapis cult, they will get a different set from the base Egyptian omens. Some countries will also have access to special omens from their patron deities. Okay, so there was some, like, English localization in there that was throwing me off for a hot second, but... I picked up on what they're putting down there. That They're saying that different religions will have different country modifiers. Like in EU4, they have small modifiers based on the religion. Like Shinto is like combat ability, infantry combat ability or morale or something like that. Uh, and so on and so forth. You know, some, some have um, tolerance of the true faith or trade income, stuff like that. So there'll be country modifiers based on your state religion. Perfect. But they're also saying is that you will have different... Not every single religion in the world has a has the exact same eight omens with a slightly different name, but also that you can change your omens based on, like, which flavor of the religion you are following based on in-game events. That is good. All good things. Unreleased only a handful of countries, uh, Dharmic countries, uh, Bactria, and Egypt can easily switch their country's religion. With religion now being more different, a more generalized approach has been taken to changing state religions, uh, especially as a number of countries in this era did adopt a foreign religion. Good, it looks like it'll be a decision. As long as you have at least one character in your country of a foreign religion, you will be able to see what it would take to change the character's religion. The requirements currently are majority of the free non-slave pops in your capital must follow the new, new faith. So the slaves, their faith doesn't matter. In a republic, your senate must approve the change. In a monarchy, you must have at least 70 legitimacy, which is usually pretty easy. A tribe, the clan leaders must approve it. Your high priest, pontifex, or equivalent must follow the new religion. So you actually have to put someone in power in the head of that of, the, of your religion that actually follows that religion and some other stuff. Cool. I like that. There, you can't just click a button and it happens. There's actually some requirements, like decisions in EU4. The effects of switching religion can be far-reaching, so it is not always a decision to be taken lightly, however. All characters that do not already follow the new faith will lose 20 loyalty. The ruler and loyal members of, your, of their family will convert to the new religion, along with the six most prominent loyal characters in your country, so a bunch of people will follow you. For a period, you will enjoy more efficient religious conversion to help uh, establish a new faith. As long as this bonus is active, you cannot change your faith again. So... I don't know what they mean exactly by it's going to be more efficient. So it'll, it'll either be a cheaper button push, which I, I always found like the button push to instant convert was pretty lame, and I don't like that. So it's just a cheaper button push wouldn't really do anything for me. Um, but a, uh, a, a modifier for the governors to convert, like a higher percentage chance, that might make a little bit more sense. And what am I looking at here? So this this is a tool tip for embracing Buddhism. Lose 400 religious power. Lose 30 stability? Oh, you know why? I was like, how 30 stability when there's only seven different digits you can have? Stability is changing from uh, minus three to positive three, from minus 100 to positive 100, and that is a slow tick, kind of like prestige is in EU4. So there, stability is changing too, so that does make sense. But thir changing religion, 30 stability, that's, that doesn't seem too much of a hit. We're in, like, eh, well, never mind. I'm, I'm going to stop saying EU4. 
Let's see, uh, National Unrest goes down. Omen Power goes up. Convert Pop re uh, Religion Cost. Yeah, okay, there it is right there. It's a 15% reduction in in cost. That's that's not that much, really. That's not much at all. Well, that's... Okay, yeah, so it's a little on the Lammer side. But that is it for today, guys. This was a, a long one, but a lot of information was in there. A lot of good changes coming, and... Uh, please let me know in the comment section what you what you think about this. I know that there's two sides of this coin right now. There's the side that said uh, of people saying, "Hey, this is probably the the most stable, most feature complete game at release." Air quotes there at release. We're, you know, focusing on on that at release. EU4 was worse at release. CK2 was worth at worse at release. Stellaris was probably on par. Hoi4 was, I would say, worse at release. Um, Maybe more entertaining at release, but 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 worse mechanically. Um, and the other side of the coin is okay. Yeah, it's it's better than some of the other ones at release. Take a drink every time I say at release. But did they forget the last ten years of development and and wh why were none of the lessons learned in the last ten years brought into this? Me personally, I feel like they had a they they had a release date. And they didn't want to do what they did with Hoi 4, which was push it back 18 months. It got pushed back six months, three separate times, if my memory serves correctly. I correct me if I'm wrong, please. But it was pushed back 18 months, and that was a that was a, a big kerfuffle. That was that was a fiasco for them. So I know that they did not want to push it back. And I think what it was was we have to get this out with whatever mechanics that will work right now and we'll fix it later which i don't exactly approve of i would have preferred if the game was pushed back and this stuff was in there at release but like i said let me know what you think in the comment section down below we'll have a discussion and uh we'll uh we'll talk about more on the next step diary thanks for watching everybody bye